Kanupiam. I'm Silvermoon LaRose, Assistant Director of the Tamaquag Museum, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you tonight to our new Culture Bearer series. Throughout this series, we hope to introduce you to some incredible Indigenous educators who have been doing the vital work of sharing and preserving cultural knowledge. Thank you so much for joining us for this very first Culture Bearer presentation of 2022. This is the first in a year long series, which was made possible thanks to funding from the Rhode Island State Council for the Arts, the Pepito Opportunity Connection, the New England Foundation for the Arts, the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities Ride Charge Grant, other anonymous funders and many community donors. You too can support our programs by making a tax deductible donation to the Tomaquag Museum. Just visit our website to support. Just a quick reminder before we get started to please make sure you're all on mute. You can engage during tonight's presentation by using the chat box. You can type in your thoughts and reactions. We will also have time to take a few questions at the end of the presentation. You can use your reaction buttons and let us see your enthusiasm. And if you're having any technical trouble, use the chat box to private message Tomaquag Tech for assistance. Now I'd like to introduce Dindana Spears. And Donna Spears, Diné Ojibwe, Chickasaw, and Choctaw, is an educator working in the public humanities. She received her Bachelor's of Arts degree in anthropology from the University of Denver and has worked for the Heard Museum, Museum of Northern Arizona, Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center, was a Peabody Essex Museum Native American Arts and Culture Fellow, and currently serves on the board of the Federation of State Humanities Councils. And Donis is the co-director of the Upstander Academy, a founding member of the Agama Educational Initiative, and is the tribal community member in residence at Brown University. Originally from Camp Verde, Arizona, we're lucky to have her here now in Hope Valley, Rhode Island, with her husband and her four beautiful children. And as a side note, I'm also wearing her earrings tonight. She's an artist as well and they feature a uh, mother with the cradle board that we're gonna be learning about tonight. So please join me in welcoming tonight's guest, Endonis. Thank you, Silver Moon, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me, everyone. Yate, she'e, Endonis Spears, and she'e, hashkan hatsoho nishle, Ojibwe people, bashish chin, tanasani dishiche, do chakta and chikisa people, dishinele. Hi everyone, I'm Indana Spears and I am Yucca Fruit Strung Out in a Line Clan from the Diné or Navajo people. I'm born for the White Earth Ojibwe people in White Earth, Minnesota. My maternal grandfather is from the Tangled Clan and my paternal grandfather is from the Choctaw and Chickasaw people in Oklahoma. And as uh, Silver Moon mentioned, I am joining you tonight from the unceded territory of the Narragansett people. Um, and it's such an honor uh, to be here to talk about a subject that is literally one of my top three favorite things to talk about in the whole wide world. So the fact that I'm being contained to an hour is really an exercise in restraint for me. So I'm just so um, excited and honored and humbled to be here to share with you um, a little bit about uh, cradle boards and their uh, symbolism um, and their importance within our native communities as we move forward into future generations. Um, and the title of this beautiful uh, series of culture bearers had me thinking um, earlier today about what is a culture bearer. And, you know, what we may think of immediately in terms of culture is usually the tip of the cultural iceberg, right, is usually kind of the more public or visible displays of culture, um, which may include um, a song or may include wearing regalia or may include um, really important parts of our culture that we are able to share and educate the public with. 
Um, and uh, underneath the surface of the water for that uh, cultural uh, iceberg is uh, the, the language, is the day-to-day, -day, is the small, less visible things that our Native people and our Native communities continue to, to do in our own homes, um, in our, at our own kitchen tables, um, in very intimate and small ways. And so I kind of wanted to honor that particular aspect of culture, the aspect of culture that is the day-to-day um, because that really grounds kind of the more visible aspects of Native cultures. Um, and so for me, it's been my experience with this particular, and I'm going to refer to cradle boards as relatives, this particular relative of the cradle board. Um, and so what is a cradle board? Well, a cradle board is a relative, meaning that it is um, made up of things that are animate, things that are living, and so it is imbued with a spirit in and of itself. It's not an object, it's not a thing. It is something that I and my family have kinship with. And so I'll refer to cradle boards as, I'll use the English term relative to refer to them. Um, and so a cradle board is a relative that holds safe um, a child, a baby. Uh, and so, uh, just so that you have an understanding, every tribe across Turtle Island or North America has their own version of a cradle board. And likewise, in their own languages, have their own words to refer to a cradle board. Um, and so I would love to do a quick kind of uh, survey of a few examples of cradle boards across Turtle Island, show you some examples, talk a little bit about the kind of aesthetic and stylistic makeup of these relatives, and, um, and then go into some more specific ways this particular relative has been influential in my own life and in my family's life. So let me share my screen. There we go. And we'll start with kind of um, one of the physically larger examples of a cradle board from the Absalica or Crow people um, in what we refer to as present day Montana. And what sets these particular styles apart from other cradle boards is the length and also the ability to attach them to um, to a horse to be mobile. We know that Absalaga people and cultures are horse cultures. And so the ability to move a baby from one space to another on a horse is very important. And so we see kind of some of these examples of, again, absolica or crow aesthetics in some of the beadwork that's used, in the quill work, in the horse hair, um, in that kind of classic triangular use of the uh, absolica uh, symbols, round symbols. And all of that is uh, utilized in um, the mama and the grandmama's work in creating these particular cradle boards. And it's always really important for me as I go through and I kind of um, uh, select images to use as my examples to whenever possible include, you know, some historic images that maybe we're very familiar with. I think if you Google cradle board, probably this uh, crow mama uh, on the left will come up as one of the first images. Uh, so we have this kind of historic idea of how cradle boards were used. And yet also cradle boards are used to parade through uh, the teepee capital of the world and crow agency um, today and on the horses of, of our of Absalaga people as they show their finery and their beadwork. to show a little bit about um, how cradle boards are these really ornate kind of pieces of art as well as being relatives. Um, Haudenosaunee style cradle boards typically have some kind of 
tree or a tree of life that connects um, this world, the world on the back of a turtle to the sky world. And so this is a common motif that you will see over and over again in the cradle boards that are produced by the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois people in what we refer to as upstate New York and Canada today. So that's the cradle board that's on the left. On the right, we can see some Anishinaabe or Ojibwe mothers who are part of a cradle board making class um, at, the at a cultural center in Minnesota who are also doing the work of producing cradle boards uh, and relatives and baby holders for their babies as well. You can see that there is a variety of different what are referred to as bows or the piece that kind of protects the baby's head. Um, some are circular, some are semicircular. When we get to our next example, we'll see how they can also be kind of a shade that comes down in front of the baby's head. And one particular uh, bow shape that is unique unto uh, Anishinaabe people is kind of this uh, this uh, uh, curvature that's like a, a inward bow in the bow itself. And we can see a couple of examples um, here with the Anishinaabe moms as they hold their, um, their cradle boards. One of the things that always um, uh, gets to me. <laughs> One of the things that really gets my goat is all uh, these beautiful relatives that are in museum collections that don't have access to a baby and that these cradle boards are really made to hold a baby and have a relationship with the living be another living being. And so I always want to, when I see these beautiful museum pictures of cradle boards, uh, take the cradle board and wrap a baby up in it just so that the cradle board will have that feeling of holding a baby again, because that was the intention. That's the reason why it was created. It wasn't created to be stored away in a drawer or in a climate controlled cabinet. It was created to hold a baby and to have kinship with another living thing. So when we look at these um, Paiute style uh, cradle boards, these are unique because of um, their almost complete reliance on willow as the primary material used to hold the baby. Again, as we go through each example, you can see how each cradle board is a reflection of the landscape it comes from, right? The same way for all of our indigenous people, all of our indigenous cultures, these are all of our material culture, quote unquote, air quotes. Um, all of the relatives that we create with our hands come from the landscape that we live within. So we can see that the same is true for our cradle boards. The same is true for the things that hold our baby. They come from the land itself and they are a reflection of the geographies they come from. So I love these examples of Paiute um, cradle boards because they have that very unique kind of over the head shade that you can cover uh, the baby's head um, to uh, keep uh, bugs away, to keep the sun off of them. You can cover them in the summertime with something sheer, like the picture that we see on the left, and in the wintertime with something heavier like buckskin um, that will keep the baby warmer and more covered in the wintertime. And of course, we have the example of a Navajo style cradle board, which is what we will kind of use as our example to delve into the, the really important role of cradle boards within our traditional communities and within our homes. So the more historic photo being the Navajo style cradle board on the right of a mama talking with her baby. And then of course, on the left of the cradle board being taken to a, a, a graduation and um, our daughter being able to snooze through her father's undergraduate graduation at URI, which is 
very handy and very useful. So that in addition to being these incredibly important relatives that reflect our kinship with living things, uh, they also are very uh, practical and useful as well. We will get in, into kind of the style uh, and the attributes of the Navajo Cradle Board in just a moment, but uh, this is another, another example of a style of cradle board. So, um, you know, as I said before, stylistically, aesthetically, these uh, baby holders vary from tribal nation to tribal nation, uh, but the intent for each is the same. It's all uh, the cradle boards are intended to hold the baby in a secure and safe place where they can observe, listen, learn, and drift off to sleep when the mood strikes. And the usage of the cradle board for each of my four children, of our four children, um, is really has been really transformative and important to me as a parent and as a mother. Um, so here in this particular picture are all four of my children at cradle board age. So cradle board age is typically, depending on your parenting style, it's kind of like breastfeeding or it's kind of like other parenting choices that you make. Like how long do you want the child to be in the cradle board? Well, usually it's up to the baby and the mama to make a, a decision together. Um, for me and our family, we usually use the cradle board from uh, day two um, through till about um, usually after the baby starts walking. So maybe, you know, around 12 months. Uh, depending on um, when the baby begins to walk. So these are all uh, four of our children um, at cradle board age. Um, on the far, on, on the bookends, you can see the Navajo style cradle board that we used uh, for all of our children, but those are the examples here. And then uh, the cradle board that's being held by Aunt Jan uh, is a Narragansett style cradle board that was made for us uh, by my mother and father-in-law, um, Cassius uh, Spears Sr. and Don Spears. And they uh, made this particular cradle board in an otter motif. I don't have a better picture and I should have mined my Google photos a little bit more closely, but uh, they use the uh, otters as the stylistic theme and they created this cradle board out of deer hide. Um, uh, the next cradle board over from that is a cradle board uh, made by my husband. Um, and this particular one also um, was made for our third son and uh, utilizes um, moose hide instead of deer hide, which is a little bit thicker and a little bit more um, sturdy, which seems to match his personality because he also is a little bit more thick and sturdy. So um, it all aligns. So um, the usage of all four of these was um, very important to us uh, because we wanted to normalize uh, using technology that is traditional to our ancestors and traditional to our communities and show our children that these forms of technology are not only very useful, um, but also are sacred in um, really important ways. So making sure that if, when we are going out into public, into different spaces, that we're able to bring the cradle board with us and utilize it whenever possible. Um, and so we have um, some key figures um, in our children's lives and kind of in the broader uh, country um, who are holding our children in their cradle boards while they um, are awake or asleep. Also really an important experience, I think, for our children, but also for um, their relatives. For all of our children's um, toys, this is also another way we uh, normalize the use of this technology by providing them with toy cradle boards of their own that they can then use to wrap up their own um, stuffed animals, their own babies, and this kind of, again, it brings culture into the day-to-day, -day, brings culture into play, brings culture into uh, children's work, which is, which is playing and imagining.
after using the cradle board for my daughter um, almost on a daily basis um, for uh, sleeping at home and also for nap time, I began to realize that um, it was also important in terms of uh, visibility um, for our native people, um, the decisions that we make around things, even as what might be considered inconsequential, but is actually quite formative for our young native people, something like how you wrap up a baby or take care of a baby, um, became almost like a political statement for me as a mother. And so having my cradle board with me um, at almost all times when my children are the appropriate age, became a really important political decision for me. And it became part of my um, uh, intentional decision making to include a cradle board wherever I went and to utilize it whenever I possibly could. So in places like the grocery store or in places like going on vacation or in places like at a birthday party, all of these things were places where we wanted to ensure that we brought this particular piece with us because um, it is um, as much of a cultural statement as it is a political statement that we are here, that we have these forms of knowledge, that we engage with them on a daily basis. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and we will get back to um, to the, the slides in just a moment. But I wanted to talk very briefly and a little bit uh, via an example about how cradle boards really are at this confluence of um, understanding plant and animal relatives. Um, they represent cosmology. They also represent um, values, our cultural values, and also are part of our baby's first ceremonies. So I wanted to use um, this particular um, Navajo cradle board to talk a little bit more about that. So let me just reach back here. Um, so as I mentioned before, this is kind of a key and important part of my experience as a mother and as a parent. Um, this particular cradle board uh, was mine when I was a baby. So it was made for me uh, by my grandparents, um, my maternal grandparents, my Che and Masana. And in this particular style of cradle board, which is the Navajo cradle board or the uh, Awetsa, uh, there is symbolism that ties our babies back to the first woman and the creation of our world as Navajo people. And I would love to go through the symbolism that wraps our children up um, with you now. So we kind of have like the classic bow that goes across the babies uh, to protect the baby's head. And this particular bow represents a rainbow, which in Diné culture is a holy and important significant a marker of our holy people or our sacred people. So this particular bow is representative of a rainbow, a rainbow that goes over the baby's head. The ties here on the side are zigzag and they're made to look like lightning. Lightning refers to the arrows that were used by the hero twins, which are original um, children of our original uh, first deity changing woman. So our first deity and creator and architect of our culture changing woman had two sons. And so their um, arrows were made of lightning. And so this particular crisscross is in reference to the arrows that were used by the hero twins at the beginning of time. So the baby is protected in body by the arrows of the two original hero twins. The hero twins are referred to again on the back of the Awetzal. There are two pieces of cedar that are connected 
And these two pieces of cedar represent the original hero twins who started at the beginning of time as well. In Diné culture, um, uh, there is a concept of ever present balance. Everything has to be in balance. And so it makes sense that we would bring our children into this culture of balance. And part of being in balance is also um, recognizing that every living being has a male side and a female side. And in Diné culture, um, the female side is the right side. So if the baby who is uh, being put in this cradle board is a girl, you take a piece of white shell and you tie it to the right side of the cradle board's rainbow. If the baby that's being put in the cradle board is a boy, you take a piece of turquoise and you tie it to the left side of the cradle board, which you can see we haven't untied the piece of turquoise from our last son who is held by this particular cradle board. One of the beautiful things about our cultures is that we have these ties to these very ancient beginning of time stories. And yet we have the dynamism or the ability to change um, kind of imbued within our own cultures themselves. So that there's a place for everyone. So for example, I had three sons. So we tied turquoise to the left side three times. When my daughter was born, we took a piece and traditionally, so all the Navajos in the room can correct me, but traditionally you would use a white shell, uh, like an abalone shell on the right side to tie to the girl side. Well, instead of using white shell, we use the white part of a wampum bead. And we use that for Nijoni, my daughter, when she was born to reflect the white shells that are here in the landscape and the homelands and home waters of her father's people. So those kinds of very intentional decisions um, in the way that we uh, wrap up our children is a really, um, I think, important and good metaphor for how our cultures um, maintain the core values of our ancestors and are also very culturally dynamic. So we did, I don't know if anyone's ever done that before us. Maybe we were the first ones to ever tie a wampum shell <laughs> to a Navajo cradle board, but it was a reflection of our family and a reflection of our own experience and cultures. So with each um, Navajo cradle board, you can use the same cradle board uh, for multiple babies, but you have to go through a ceremony between each baby to prepare the cradle board as a living thing for its next relationship with another baby. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about that experience um, with you now. So let me go ahead and reshare my screen. Again, this is another example of the cultural flexibility that's built into our ways of being. So in between each baby, every time you're gonna use the cradle board for a new baby, so the cradle board is now gonna have a new relationship with another baby, you untie it all together. Every piece you can take it apart by tying. There's no nails. There's no glue. There's nothing you have to pry or break open. It's all tied together with leather, pieces of leather. And so you can untie the cradle board. And traditionally, if we were at home in Arizona within the four sacred mountains, we would have a medicine man come over and help us conduct this particular ceremony of tying a cradle board, untying a cradle board and retying it but we don't live within the four sacred mountains. Our family lives in Hope Valley, Rhode Island. And so instead uh, we did this particular ceremony as a family, all of us together. So these are pictures of my mother and my mother-in-law untying the cradle board and retying it together. 
as you untie each piece, and then when you retie together with new pieces of leather, so you replace the leather, um, the pieces of leather that tie together, as you retie it, whoever is in charge of retying that particular knot or that particular juncture also says a prayer for the baby for that particular part of their body or spirit. So for example, you can see my husband's hands tying the rainbow and my mother is there to help him. At that point, once the rainbow is retied, my husband will say a prayer for the baby's brain development and will say a prayer for the part of the baby that's cognitive, the part of the baby that has to think and figure out and figure out what it's going to do in this lifetime. When the baby's, uh, when the cradle board is being retied with the two pieces in the back, the person who's in charge of that portion says a prayer for the baby's backbone, both physically and metaphorically, <laughs> that the baby will stand strong in what it believes in. And also the baby will have a strong straight back to do a lot of hard work for the community. When the, when the part at the feet, the foot rest is being tied, we pray for the places that the baby's feet will take them during their lifetime. We pray over their feet. We pray that their feet will be guided and blessed and that they will walk in Hojon for all the days of their life. And this particular ceremony of praying piece by piece as we put the cradle board back together is very um, important and very meaningful for all of us because we have yet to really technically meet the baby as a family or community, but we feel tied to the baby because of this particular ceremony. And this ceremony is the baby's induction into our world. It's the first ceremony for the baby and the baby has not arrived yet, but it's a really formative and important one the first ceremony of many, many ceremonies the baby will have during its lifetime. So if we consider some of the cultural values that are included in the cradle board, and we think about kind of indigenous approaches to parenting, uh, cradle boards are meant to be propped up much in the way I have it propped up here and I tried to solicit an actual baby for this presentation today and was unsuccessful. <laughs> um, maybe if we tried a little bit harder we could find a baby under one but I did try to track down a baby that I could wrap up in this cradle board for demonstration purposes. Uh, but we were unable to this evening, but if there were a baby in this cradle board, we would want to prop it up the way it's propped up in the chair. This is very important because it allows the baby to kind of stand for a little while and observe what mom, dad, brothers, and sisters are doing. Um, and then when the baby gets sleepy enough, then we can recline the baby. But really, cradle boards are meant to be propped up so that the baby can observe. And this is a really important value within our communities because that is how baby learns how to be a human being. It learns by watching the other human beings interact with one another and how they treat one another. Also in our Diné culture, we believe strongly in the importance of swaddling. For those of us that have raised children um, here, it, swaddling is a really important physical aspect of making sure that babies have enough time to sleep, but also um, that babies are able to uh, recreate uh, a feeling of being inside of the womb, which is very important, especially in these first few days as the baby is moving from the spirit world into, into the physical world, which is where we live. So if we think about all of the things that go into a cradle board, the actual physical pieces, for our Diné cradle board, it's made of cedar. And cedar is one of our four sacred plants. So it's by no accident that we use a sacred material to hold our children, like our first, the baby's first holder outside of another 
human being is actually our cedar trees. And we think about the deer that gave up its life for the leather and for the ties, and that these are all reflections on things that sacrificed in order for our baby to be held in security. And so that's another value that the cradle board represents a physical manifestation of these relationships with plants and animals and the sacrifices and accountability that we have to them as human beings. So just to kind of wrap up and close a little bit, um, and now that we've kind of talked about this particular example, I was, re again, reflecting on the cradle board and its role within our homes. And for those of us that grew up in Native homes, oftentimes a cradle board is like a piece of art. After it's been used, we hang it up on the uh, wall and it sits there and watches us kind of go about our daily lives. And um, that's how I grew up. I grew up with cradle boards as art on my wall. And as a kid, I never touched them. I never played with them. I had my own toys. I had my own toy cradle boards. Um, and I never really actively saw them being used within my own home. In, outside in the community, I saw other moms with their cradle boards, but the ones in my home hung on the wall. And when I got pregnant with my first child, my mom brought us the cradle board and showed us the tying ceremony, the tying and retying ceremony, and we participated in that. And all of a sudden, the cradle board became active again. It went from being something that kind of observed our day-to-day -day lives on the wall to something that now we reached for every day, all of the time. And we brought it with us, as I showed you, on vacation to stop and shop. Uh, to uh, class, to um, everywhere we went. And it became very active again. It became a member of the family again. And it had a job again. And this relative kind of went from being dormant to being awake again. And now all of my children are no longer cradle board age. And so we've put them back up on the wall again. And they watch us again in kind of a dormant state. And Cassius and I were thinking, and we realized that the next time we're going to wake up these cradle boards is for our grandchildren. And that's such a beautiful thought to think about. And I'm getting emotional about it because I look forward, <laughs> thank you, I look forward um, for when these cradle boards are gonna wake up again. And they, this time they'll hold our grandchildren. And everything that my mother did for us, everything that my mother and father-in-law did for us in making cradle boards for us and showing us how to use them, now we get to do that. Now we get to show our children how to wrap up their babies in this special carrier. And the cradle boards get to live again and kind of wake up again. They're sleeping now. And they're here for presentation purposes. But the next time I will uh, wrap up a baby in this cradle board after it's been retied will be my own grandchildren. And so thinking about that kind of life cycle of how we understand things like cradle boards within our cultures, um, you can understand why I'm hesitant to use the word object because they are more than that. And they are important parts of our multi-generational families. And so um, this particular presentation has caused me to reflect and think about that and think about the life cycle of our relatives um, and how important it is that we live uh, in kinship with them and we honor them for the roles that they play within our lives. Uh, so uh, I'm just so grateful to be able to talk about my uh, favorite subject, as I said before, really there's only like two other things in the world I could talk about for an hour very easily. Uh, one is like Lady Gaga, uh, and <laughs> but this Cradle Boards is like, a, I think beats out Lady Gaga as a really important uh, part of our family. So I'm just so grateful and thankful for everyone um, for 
you know, I know we live in a time when being on Zoom, we're on Zoom all day, every day for various meetings and for work. So it means a lot to me that you are willing to share another hour on Zoom uh, with me to talk about something that hopefully is a little bit educational and also brings your spirit into a place um, where you can uh, better understand our, our relatives that we have within our homes. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, and Donis, um, when you were talking about that passing on, it brought back memories of when we dug out our uh, moss bag from where we keep all our cultural belongings to give to our granddaughter for, um... now mind you, my granddaughter and my youngest son are only like four years apart. <laughs> so it hadn't been very long uh, before we saw it again, but it is a beautiful transition and an exciting one. Um, so I'm hoping you have a couple of, um, you, we have about 15 minutes left to have some questions and we do have um, one in the chat already. If you have questions, you can either put them in the chat or raise your hand and we'll um, try to take them one by one. And I'll start with the first. Um, Does an expectant mother ever make her own cradle board or is it always passed down or a gift from another relative? Yeah, I think it's really great, these processes of survivance and reclamation. And, you know, there were generations where cradle boards were not being used as actively or as pervasively. And so when I showed um, the image of the Anishinaabe mothers who were in a cradle board making class, learning how to make cradle boards for their children. I think that that's such a powerful and important reminder of the intentional decisions Native people make to maintain culture or what is referred to sometimes as survivance. Survivance is a combination of the words survive and resistance. And it acknowledges the intentional decisions that Native people make. They are not passive kind of survivors of settler colonialism or of genocide, but are actually active architects in their own futures and make decisions about that on a daily basis. And the mothers in that Anishinaabe uh, cradle board making class made a decision to take a class to learn to do something they'd never done for the benefit of their children and their grandchildren and their great great grandchildren. And so, yes, there are times and places where mamas will make their own um, cradle boards for their children. And again, as I mentioned, like we use kind of a Navajo cradle board because that's um, the one that I'm most familiar with and that's my own culture. So I feel very um, confident speaking on that, but every tribal nation has kind of their own protocols and rules that go around any kind of form of, of um, what is sometimes called material culture or um, creating um, our animate kind of living relatives. Um, and then another person had asked, um, can, it be, can a cradle board be made as a gift? And yes, um, Mary, and that's one of the things that I really also appreciate about the um, these legacies of survivance that our grandparents and our great grandparents have given us that um, we can also um, revive the process of making cradle boards and giving them to members of our communities, which I have seen. Um, uh, and so I think that that's um, really a beautiful and important um, part of, of survivance as well. No, I have a question for you. Um, your, the cradle boards that you have for your children are Navajo style, but I know that um, you also are, both you and Cricket members of other tribal communities, are any of the other cradle boards from any of those other tribal communities? Yes, thank you. Um, so um, when I was, uh, where, where I was born in Camp Verde, which is not on the Navajo reservation, but it's south of the Navajo reservation, the community there in Camp Verde was actually Yavapai Apache. And so when I was born and um, my mom had lots of uh, friends who were Apache and I have also um, downstairs an Apache style cradle board um, that my mom used for me when I was little, even though we are not, um, we're not 
by heritage or community Apache. It was just gifted to her for me. And so we have that one as well. Uh, Cassius made, uh, my husband made an Ojibwe style cradle board for Gijek. And Gijek is our third son and he has an Ojibwe name. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but he made an Anishinaabe style cradle board for Gijek. And then um, my mother and father-in-law made cradle boards um, for myself and, and my sister-in-law and my brother-in-law who all happen to have sons in a very short amount of time. So they just kind of had a cradle board making conveyor belt and they made those for us. And um, we're so honored and blessed to have them and to use them. And also, you know, what are the mnemonic devices or the physical, you know, kind of tactile things, relatives that we can use to tell stories to our children. And I think Cradle Words provide another example of how we can do that. We can tell our children and our grandchildren about when, um, you know, my mother and father-in-law made uh, a Cradle Board and what each design means that my mother-in-law used to decorate it and the materials that they gathered for it. So, um, you know, we happen to be talking about something that's very like cute and brings up a lot of emotions, but these same rules apply for almost all pieces of material culture within our indigenous communities as well. That these are like vehicles to tell stories and to go over genealogies. Um, we had another question uh, wondering how um, would you learn to, how would someone learn to make a cradle board? Very good question. So, um, you know, if you are coming from, if you are from a, a tribal community and you are interested in, again, kind of reclaiming this space, reclaiming this really important part of a young person's uh, experience and stories, um, I would uh, reach out to the elders within your community and ask if they have any cradle board stories or ask if they have uh, know of anyone who knows how to still make cradle boards. And, um, you know, like I said, every tribal community has their own protocols. Um, and usually when you want to approach uh, an artist or an elder um, to make something like physical together, uh, make a, a piece of art or a bowl or a container, and this is a container, um, then usually that comes along with um, a series of stories, <laughs> a series of teachings, um, a series of reflections. So it's not just about kind of the mechanics of like now you take piece A and put it into piece B and you attach piece C. Really, we are making something that is our ancestors made. And so there's knowledge attached to that. And there usually it's a very um, long and um, important process of telling stories and learning about teachings and values and all the things that we talked about this evening. So um, I would start with um, elders and asking if they um, have cradle board stories, if they know of people who are making cradle boards, and then those artists will kind of be the ones to help you um, understand what the protocols are around that. And um, even today, like if you go back to the Navajo Nation, you can buy a cradle board. I mean, you can purchase a cradle board uh, with money and they it's a piece of art um, in many ways as well. So you have artists who make incredible, incredible cradle boards and each cradle board kind of has their own like stylistic take and you can kind of, especially for these artists who are, you know, bending and shaping wood with steam and with the fire and heat. Um, they also, you know, have their own little signatures that make each cradle board different and distinct unto itself. So that's something to also kind of keep in mind that there's a ceremonial aspect to this. And also it is, it is art and there are fine art artists who are making cradle boards as well. I have um, kind of a silly question. My, my husband was raised um, in a uh, cradle board and we always joke that uh, the back of his head is flat. They call it cradle board head <laughs> uh, <laughs> from laying on a flat surface. 
Um, have you heard that before? Is there, is there something that you talk about in the community and are there ways to prevent cradle board head? <laughs> so that's so, um, yes, yeah, so absolutely familiar. Um, I don't, you know, cradle board head it comes about as a result of a mama's commitment to using the cradle board on a daily basis, which I do feel strongly all four of my children do. I think my mom didn't really wrap me up in a cradle board that much because I have a little curvature back here. And you know, that also is an indicator of, um, you know, there were some tribal nations that, um, uh, that had every culture has their own um, understandings of aesthetic and beauty. And there are tribal cultures that, you know, use the, the very opportune time when babies' heads uh, are so um, soft to make them into like the perfect shape. And, um, and I have heard of cradle board head. It is a real thing. It's a real phenomena. And yes, absolutely. <laughs> 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 Mishki, did you have a question? I think I saw your hand was up. I did have a quick question. Um, I've, I'm just wondering, like, I know you had said that you used the cradle board till they were about a year old. Um, but is there, like, I've, I've heard of, of somebody whose child was a little bit older and he was so used to sleeping in the cradle board that he wanted to be in the cradle board um and was to take his nap so is there like a time where uh you know they really can't be in that anymore <laughs> yes I too have heard like I said it's you know it really is a um contract between the baby themselves and the parents as to when they are going to phase certain things out of their lives um so it's really up to the baby and the parents um, as to how long they want to use a cradle board. Um, but I have also heard of children up to two years old, kind of when they get sleepy, going and getting their cradle board and walking to mom with the cradle board. <laughs> and I've heard of those um, instances. So it really just depends on how long um, you want to do that. Um, I kept mine in for as long as I possibly could. So um, you know, in the initial days when babies are sleeping, you know, 80% of the day, um, it's also how I got full night sleep. So I would have a bassinet next to our bed, and then I would um, lay the cradle board kind of at an angle and tie the baby up when I would go to sleep, and the baby would sleep for, you know, a good solid amount of hours, which would allow me to get some sleep as well. Um, and then as the baby gets older and more wiggly, um, then we started to use the cradle board for nap time only. And also this was really helpful for us um, uh, because it uh, would ensure like very regular kind of nap schedules for our children. So we found that to be um, really positive as well. And, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier and something I forgot to say um, during during my uh, presentation, um, it, it, you know, for me personally, I live in Narragansett homelands. I'm very far away from my own home, my own homelands. And, um, you know, I, I think about like what kind of, uh, how good of a culture bearer am I really, <laughs> if it's just me, you know, and my children have incredible family, they have incredible Narragansett family, and they're so grounded and rooted in their Narragansett culture, and I'm so proud of that, and I'm so honored that they able are able to have that, um, and I think about my own role uh, as the primary culture bearer in this household, which all women are, um, and I realized that, um, you know, our women are containers. We are the containers of culture. We are the holders of culture and we travel uh, very well um, into other spaces and we bring our culture with us and we bring our knowledge with us. And um, my mother married a non-Navajo and my mother uh, lives in Oklahoma now. And my aunt who uh, is from Oklahoma, 
married an Absalica man and all my cousins are uh, Absalica and they live in Montana and she's lived there my whole life. Um, and my grandmother also is from Minnesota and she lived in Oklahoma and then Arizona. And I think about all these women who are living in the homelands and territories of their husband's people and just how incredibly beautifully they were able to bring their cultures with them. And that's so um, empowering to me and it emboldens me um, to be the container, to be the holder. And um, I'm just, I, that was kind of another really important reflection that we're talking about culture bearers. We're talking about the people and the relatives that hold our cultures and for our women, um, you know, I'm here in, in Narragansett land, and yet I'm able to bring parts of that here with me, and I, I feel um, really emboldened and empowered to do that. Thank you so much for that. Um, thank you again for sharing your cultural knowledge. Um, we're so blessed to have you in our community, and you have come and you have shared so much with us. Um, so we love having you. <laughs> And thank you for sharing your stories and your memories. I think this is an amazing expression of womanhood and what a great way to say Pishkanash to Women's History Month until next year. So thank you so much for your commitment to preserving this knowledge for future generations. Thank you everyone. And yes, it is the last day of Women's History Month and um, I think that that is uh, so important that we carry this, uh, what we've learned uh, during this month with us throughout the rest of the year. And I'm just really honored to, to be a part of this conversation this evening. So thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And we'll definitely have to bring you back. <laughs> <laughs> and I also want to thank all of you for joining us for this Culture Bearer series. Um, before you go, I want to invite you to some upcoming events. I want to make sure you come back next month on April 14th for our second Culture Bearer presentation with James Vukulich, who will be sharing about the seven generations and the seven grandfather teachings of the Anishinaabe. And this presentation is a wonderful complement to this year's Read Across Rhode Island book choice, Firekeeper's Daughter by Angeline Bully. I highly recommend if you haven't read it yet. It is a young adult book, but certainly um, adults of all ages will definitely enjoy this read. Our director, Lorenz Spears, is this year's honorary chair for the Read Across Rhode Island program. And you can read along with us if you visit rhodeislandbooks.org. It's ribooks.org. And you can learn more about this year's pick along with all of the companion reads um, so that there's a book for every age level. Um, and they're all really fantastic. And there's lots of events that accompany. So you wanna make sure that you register for them. I think just next week, there'll be an interview um, and a conversation with Robin Wall Kimmerer, author of Braiding Sweetgrass, and you'll get to ask some questions of this author. The very next day, uh, we have Cynthia Leedich Smith with, for Ancestors Approved, who we'll be having a conversation with, and they'll be back in May with the author and illustrator of We Are Water Protectors. So definitely um, sign up, register for those, and come back. And if you're interested in more cultural programming, um, Tomaquag Museum offers a large variety of tours, visiting museum educator services, virtual presentations, workshops, professional development, and much more. You can learn more on our website, or you can give us a call or send an email to discuss options. You'll talk to me, so just ask for Silver Moon. Uh, tonight's presentation, along with many others, will be available on our YouTube page, so be sure to circle back and share with your family and friends. To, we want to say thank you again to our funders at the Rhode Island State Council of the Arts, uh, Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, the Rye Charge Grant, the Papito Opportunity Connection, the New England Foundation for the Arts, and other generous funders and donors like you. Please consider making a tax-deductible donation to Tomaquag Museum, and please support our 401 Gives campaign. That starts tomorrow. You can um, donate, but please also share um, and help us uh, do the work of trying to support this organization to give you more. 
Information is available on our website and you can also support local indigenous artists by shopping and sharing our online store. That's a branch of our program for indigenous empowerment. So be sure to check that out. So Tabatni Anawayan, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And we hope to see you again next month for the second presentation in our Culture Bearer series. Uh, Wuni Nakan everyone, have a good night. Mm -hmm.